right guys I'm feeling froggy today if you can see the last three pulls on this bike was 207 206.97 and 207 on pump gas I rolled it off the dyno I wiped it off and now we're gonna go for a ride just like it was on the dyno that means full power K track off mods to the bike just look at our Jixzilla series. We did absolutely everything the same. We have a pentacarbon exhaust. We have a power commander on there. A Sprint P08 F1-85. Allison Oil. Petron. And probably the biggest single largest improvement is the BT Moto. This is the second stage flash. Um, and I put a map selector switch for the power commander so Right now it's on map one, which I've got set to pump gas. And map two, if we decided to put MR12 in it, this thing made, it made 214 horsepower all day long with MR12. Didn't matter what the weather was, super consistent. I'm really excited to take this bike for a ride. So why don't we do that? Oh yeah. previously with various different flashes that the on-off throttle transition was very abrupt especially in the high rpms so i got with my boy brendan and i said hey man i'm sure people aren't going to like this because it was really jerky before unfortunately i don't have any video footage of that um, but he says hey brock don't worry about it i'll let me go mess around with some stuff and try it so he sent me several different versions to try and this is what we've come up with with the final version and I got to tell you it is so much smoother than the previous mapping and I mean don't get me wrong these bikes are fairly smooth to begin with but it was just that on off throttle transition you know I'd liken it to you know coming into a curve getting through the curve and uh, getting back on the gas I mean it would it would it would basically upset the chassis it almost it, I won't say stalled but it had a really unpleasant recovery after you put the throttle back on so I'm gonna try and ride someplace where I can put that through the test a little bit more this particular area in Mexico is not so suited for that auto whipper Also with the uh, optimized shift points now with the bike all up in the air and the front end at stock it seemed like it's still killing a little long but before we uh, before we put this map out you know for for others we'll make sure that we've got that optimized as well as we can Idle's also real nice on this bike. There's no hunting and surging and any of that other silliness that some bikes are known for. Stays really stable. And that's after installing the pipe and filter and really increasing the airflow compared to stock. Check 
can hear a little bit. bike in a while I gotta sort of get used to it because it's really fast now be dangerous in the, in the wrong hands. Wow. This is a really nice bike. I gotta tell you. You know, some people say, oh, Brock, you're, you're pro Suzuki or you're pro BMW. Well, I am pro the latest, greatest, best, fastest technology. When the new GSX-R came out, I really liked that bike. It was great to see Suzuki coming back out with a killer. But quite frankly, it didn't last long. The uh, 2020 BMW came out. And for leader bikes, it absolutely ruled the horsepower world. We went out to one national event, won the event, and in testing went considerably faster than the national record held by the same rider on a ZX-10 and by the next race they had slapped so many piddledies and things on us that the BMW became not the bike to have in the class anymore. That's why I see so many ZX, uh, ZX-14s. ZX but I gotta tell you this bike from the time we put it on the dyno, okay, completely stock, 179, yeah, yeah, we know about all that, right? We know that it's Big Brother and emissions and crap. But once we got this thing restricted, it was very clear that Kawasaki brought their A game. And when I say their A game, I mean, I've really enjoyed the ZX-10s, started messing with them in 04, 05, most definitely fast motorcycles, but they just keep getting refined and keep getting better. Now in stock form, are you gonna notice? Maybe. But as soon as you get into them and undo all the stuff that uh, the factories are forced to put in them these days, this bike is a rocket ship. And I gotta tell you, if you watch my Hayabusa video, I was saying that you know, back in the day, the Kawasaki's weren't exactly known for being reliable. Well, that's all changed, and I mean, the ZX-14s compared to some of the earlier bikes, the 12s and 11s, especially when you start getting into the 14R, that's an amazing motor. We beat the shit out of those things. I don't know how anybody ever breaks them unless they're just doing something wrong. And we've done the same thing with the ZX-10s. Our, our long-term sprint filter test bike is uh, our buddy Mike's 2016. He's got 25,000 miles on that thing. We've had it on the dyno, hundreds and hundreds of dyno pulls, and I can put it up there right now, and it will be within a horsepower or two of where we started. And this engine here uh, looks like it's exactly the same. And when, one of the things that you notice as a builder is how consistent is the engine? What does it do in different you know in different atmospheric conditions and when I say that you know it's primarily humidity how well does it take humidity does it really slow down does it slow down not as much well this, the key to that is having more compression and this thing has bunches of compression I can tell you we've we've had it in some of the worst weather and some of the best weather and it is so 
blindly, blatantly consistent, it makes product development and tuning very, very easy. I'm super impressed with this motor. It, during the map development process, I mean, we have the exhaust pipes glowing cherry red. It doesn't care. It doesn't hurt them. They are. These things are absolutely bulletproof. And right now, the, my only complaint with the Z, <laughs> with the ZX10s is they they're just not comfortable for me. I mean, I'm five foot eight. I'm 190 pounds. I got a big old beer belly in the way. I got short arms. But people who buy these bikes really don't buy them for comfort. They buy them for speed. And boy, you got that with these things. I wish there was some place around here that I could actually go and try this thing out top speed wise and really see what it'll do, but <laughs> my my driver's license is yelling at me to get that head out of that thought out of my head. <laughs> Maybe we'll see if we can find a place a little later, but for now, I'm just trying to get used to the bike. Maybe I'll go for a ride with another bike, just see where we're at. I don't know if you ever noticed it, but anytime you make a change to your own motorcycle, it's the fastest bike in the world when you're riding by yourself. <laughs> you go riding with somebody else, especially somebody else fast, you go, oh, well, maybe that wasn't the best direction for my change. just nothing like a fast a fast sport bike and this thing I mean especially the last bike I was on was that Gen 1 Hayabusa I mean it's a tank this thing just effortlessly moves around I felt the front end get light I got to tell you I'm not a big fan of the speed uh, the speed uh, sensitive steering dampers they're great in a parking lot but if you're like me and you like holding on to a motorcycle that's going a hundred and God knows whatever mile an hour. They can get a little twitchy. So, so I, we will be replacing the damper on this with a new Batubo, a regular manual. Oh yeah. It just comes back on so much better now. <laughs> That's a nice bike. I like that bike. Who we got to mess with? Gen 3 Boost up there. It's not ready. Oh, my Hayabusa Chronic. That's a fast motorcycle. But unfortunately, it's torn apart too, so that we can figure out the Gen 3 Boost using the Gen 2 Boost as a guide. We got uh, one of our employees' Triumphs here. Not really fair. We do have Mike ZX10, our are dirty, well-worn, <laughs> how many miles? Oh, he doesn't have his key in it. It's got a lot of miles. That thing runs good. That's when we raced against the uh, ZH2. We'll figure it out. We'll get something and go play around. Hey guys, in our 40,000 subscriber episode, I mentioned that we had been doing some velocity stack testing. I'm back on the ZX10 now and I'm getting ready to put it back together it's several weeks later, so our weather's changed. I want to get a I want to get a uh, a baseline in this weather before we put the good gas in it. See what kind of power this thing will really make. But the question is, drum roll, please. That's a crappy drum roll. Um, which stacks am I putting back in? Am I putting back the Gen st Six stacks that went in the they came in the bike? The Gen Five stacks that we borrowed from uh, one of our employees, or some printed carbon stacks, or no stacks at all. Well, if you wanna look here, you will see some very funky shaped stacks that have air gaps right here that make people nervous for some reason. What is this shape? What is that? Those are the Gen 6 stacks back in the bike. Why? 
because we got the best overall results with these velocity stacks as far as average power. Now I'll pull up dyno charts to show you all this stuff in a minute, but really the moral of the story is who knows better about what velocity stacks should be in which engine than the engineers that designed the engine? No one. That's why they put them in there. It's really good stuff. Now I'm not saying that you can't move power. If you want to go land speed racing, put some shorter ones in. If you want more torque, put some longer ones in. Just move it where you want it. But as far as the best overall performance, across the board and additionally up top those things won. I'll show you those numbers here in a minute. Hey everybody well as you can see <laughs> hoodie these are for sale in our store by the way um, it's a different time yet again I'm not going to apologize for some of the craziness that's going to go on in this video and the way we had to shoot it because we had other things going on because business is so good very successful I will say that it's been a long time in between and we did lose some information wasn't lost it was just so too terrible to show we'll get to that later um, but anyway we're gonna do the best we can I gotta have a cheat sheet here because I'm actually gonna go through a lot of information in this video and I'm gonna go through it pretty quickly because I don't want to bore you guys with a bunch of details but if you have any particular questions if you look at our videos guys ask questions all the time and I promise they get answered, and 99% of them get answered by me personally. So anyway, before we get into the stacks, let's start from the very beginning. So uh, our buddy Mike brought the bike in, bone stock. He didn't remember which fuel was in it. He did tell me, though, that it had already had its first oil change. It had about 1,400 miles on it, and when they changed the oil, it did have the... Uh, Kawasaki 10W40 full synthetic, which is about the best thick oil that you can get. So power wise, the bike did pretty well. Now I will tell you when I went for my ride, I misspoke. I said 179 horsepower. If you want to look in completely stock form, the way it rolled up, it made 177 horsepower. Now that's bone stock, stock air cleaner, stock exhaust, no tune, no nothing. So the first thing that we did, we, we worked very closely with, with Brendan at BT Mode. I'm telling you what, I'm really getting impressed with that guy. He knows a whole lot of stuff and he's great at applying it and we get results. You get results at, as a result of his uh, work ethic. Anyway, um, we did quite a bit of work. He had sent over some mapping, of, or sent over a different flash. We tried a bunch of different things back and forth, back and forth. Some of it worked, some of it didn't. Not going to bore you with it. It'd be an entire video on its own. But I'm going to show you where we ended up completely stock. Now, this is not something I would normally do for myself. I went ahead and put a power commander on the bike with the stock exhaust so I could create fuel mapping for Brendan so he can download that into the ECU for the guys who don't want power commanders. But we were getting some really impressive horsepower. And when I say impressive, let me show you this. In a very short period of time, we went from 177 horsepower to 199. And look at all this extra power that we suddenly found. Now, found, we didn't find it. Uh, it's always been in there. The Kawasaki engineers put it in there, but they can't let us have it. Noise abatement, emissions, you guys know the deal. So when we go to race these motorcycles though, we don't want them in that form. We want them in the killer form. So I worked really hard to try to get Brendan 200 horsepower so he could have bragging rights there. We didn't make it. I'd say 199.5 is close enough to 200 which that should tell you with no other parts added other than a flash and a tune, what kind of motor that Kawasaki put in this 2021 ZX-10. Now, from there, things went on, a little tuning here, a little tuning there. We got it, we tried as hard as we could to get up to 200 horsepower, couldn't do it. I'm gonna go ahead and take the stock one down. We don't care about that anymore. So we installed our pentacarbon exhaust. Now. If you see any of our other videos, especially when it comes to Kawasaki, the Kawasaki engineers are so good 
at stock exhaust development. The days of picking up 15 horsepower peak just by putting on a pipe, man, those are long gone. They've been gone for a long, long time. So what can we do? Well, as an exhaust developer, we can go and change where power is. We can actually create it better in certain areas because I can lengthen a secondary collector because I don't have to worry about a catalytic converter having to be in there. This is race stuff. So when we put on the pipe, did we pick up a bunch of peak horsepower? Well, no, it says right here, we went from 199.5 to 203. What? Is that even worth the price? Well, wait, hold on a second. What's going on here? 11 horsepower. There's another damn near 11. So you can see right here, while we didn't set any peak power records, man, did we really pick up in the middle. And I can tell you what, this motor, uh, it, it's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you in on some stuff. This thing set some records on our dyno. But one of the things that Kawasaki did, they sort of robbed Peter to pay Paul. That, that bike doesn't have a lot of bottom end power. It's got loads of peak. So anything we can do to pick up the bottom end power and the mid range through here is just nothing but gravy, especially if we don't lose peak power, which we didn't, we gained it. So anyway, let me, uh, let me show you where we ended up. Obviously, when we put on our exhaust, the next thing we want to do is tune it all up, make sure that the exhaust matches the bike. I'll show you what we ended up with here. After we did, after we tuned it up, now you can see we picked up a little more peak, but we picked up even more over here as far as, you know, 105 to 119. We, we, just, we just got a big gap. Let me pull that out of the way so that you can see. I mean, that is a healthy gain just from an exhaust and mapping the, east, or mapping the bike through the power commander. All right. Sorry, I gotta have my cheat sheet here. So much going on. Okay. We're gonna talk about velocity stacks here in one moment. All right, thank goodness for notes. Um, before we get into the velocity stacks, the one other thing that we decided to do to the bike uh, was install a sprint filter. We put in the full race, the P0, P08 F1-85. No changes, no mapping. Let me go ahead and pull that up. So I've got the 204 chart we just had up. Throw spread filter in here. Okay, well, let's go see what we got. All right, we went from 204 to 205. Is that a lot? Yeah. One horsepower or so, one and a half. That's nice. But wait a minute. Look up here. 195 to 199.8. So up in the very higher revs, that Sprint filter was worth 198 to 193, five horsepower, five. Now think about this also. The bike is on a dyno, it's a static application. It doesn't have 150 mile an hour breeze going through it. So the Sprint filter is worth five horsepower up top with the bike stationary, that just goes up considerably. I don't even know what it is, it's about, now, I don't want to do the math in my head, but it's a dynamic equivalent of 10, probably 10 to 12 horsepower with the bike at full speed. These things are the real deal. That's why we sell the hell out of them. Anyway, enough about Sprint Filter. They're badass. If you don't have one, you need one. All right, let's go over to the velocity stacks. Now, obviously, if we put in the Sprint Filter, we already got, had the gas tank up. We had everything ready. Let's do some filter testing, or I mean uh, some stack testing. So one of the things I noticed with this bike, and if you noticed in that clip, where that little air gap was, underneath that was effectively a very short velocity stack. See the gap here? This is with the stacks removed. So this is actually just the inlet that holds the air box to the throttle body, but it's got a nice little radius. And I thought, well, how? Past experience tells me that if we take a long velocity stack like this, and we shorten it way down short like that, we're gonna pick up power in the over rev. Unfortunately, it comes with a power loss through the middle, but I saw that and I went, oh man, let's 
just take them out. So one of the things I love about dynos, I love practical experience and I love knowing what I'm doing, but I will tell you, sometimes you get curveballs thrown at you. What I saw when I removed those velocity stacks was most definitely not what I expected. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull everything out except except for the one with the sprint filter in. And now we're gonna pull out the velocity stacks. Look at this. Okay, we, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. Did we pick up a little in the over rev? Um, yeah, you know, a horsepower? But wow, did it butcher power all the way up the curve. Now, that is a really strange looking chart and I'd have lost money <laughs> if I would have bet that this gain wouldn't have been better and these losses wouldn't have been smaller. But listen, it is what it is. That's why we do our testing. We can think we know what's going on, but this actually showed us what's going on. So let me show you something here now. Um, all right, we went from no velocity stacks whatsoever. Uh, we went ahead and just installed a set of printed carbon fiber stacks. I'm not gonna tell you whose they are. They can come on here and say, hey, those are my stacks. Because there are certain areas where they really did a nice job in other areas not quite so much so let me I, I didn't even i didn't even pursue additional with the no stacks because if you see this air fuel line is straight as an arrow it's a dead ass overlay from the past before so there's no tuning i can do to make this go away this is a mechanical issue it's a problem and the only way that we can repair it isn't with a tune it's by changing other mechanical parts so let me go in here. I'm gonna go ahead and keep the good one up and just pull the uh, no stack completely out. And we're gonna throw in the printed stacks, printed carbon fiber stacks with no other changes. So what did we get? We come in here, you can see the red line is the printed ones. We lost up the curve, lost, lost, lost lost and then we really didn't gain much of anything up here now this is going to be really difficult for some people to comprehend a lot of times what we see is maybe the bike won't have a really good and and you know listen i'm gonna go ahead and pat myself on the back and pat dino jet on the back look how straight as an arrow those air fuel curves are okay they're straight but is that where the bike makes the most horsepower for the conditions on that day? What happens a lot of times is guys will throw their bike on the dyno. They have a certain tune in it. They put product A in there and poof. Wow, we've got five more horsepower. Well, did the product make five horsepower or did the product mask a poor tune? So when I test velocity stacks versus the way other guys may, may test them, I'm not exactly sure. It's just something that I've built. This, uh, this is a, a structure I've built over the years. I will put, that, put them in, I'll get them exactly where I think they need to be, and then I'll see if I can optimize them. Let's give it more fuel. Maybe in the conditions on that day, more fuel will be good. Let's give it less fuel. Maybe in the conditions on that day, less fuel will be good. So basically, we had already optimized uh, the Gen 6, uh, or I mean the uh, Gen 6 stacks to the best of our ability. We put the sprint filter in, it didn't really need, it didn't need a tune for that. So when I went in and I actually optimized the tune, and I optimized the fueling. So then you can come back in here and see, okay, now we actually picked up a little bit more peak power. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit more. And you can see we're the green line now. Uh, we picked up a little bit more in, in some areas, but that's as much horsepower as I can make. You can come in here and look, look in this area. You can see the air fuel ratio optimized is considerably different, but look at the power reading. It's obviously the best for what's going on. So that's the best comparison I know how to make. That is, the, uh, the, the carbon fiber stacks were tuned to peak, peak performance compared to the other ones tuned to peak performance. And we still have 
a little bit of lost horsepower down here. Let me see if we can make go in here. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit more. Okay, so look you here. Uh, we can we can go in and compare 201. Now we got 203 up here in the over rev. So we were able to tune a bit more peak power out of them. So are the printed carbon fiber stacks bad? No, they 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 made more peak horsepower. But I'm not willing to trade that peak horsepower for that big a loss in the middle, if that makes sense. Let me go back and uh, let me rescale this stuff. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and leave the optimized uh, printed stacks. Now, Mike, uh, who, who's our, our, uh, our, our gen, uh, oh God, what gen is that? Five, I guess, 2016 ZX10, our long-term project bike. We put some really cool uh, billet velocity stacks in his bike, and he liked them, so he kept them. So he had a spare set of Gen 5 um, OEM velocity stacks laying around. He's like, hey, Brock, the Internet says these work better than the Gen 6. Ha! Huh. I love the Internet. Learn all kinds of good stuff. <laughs> also get pointed in the wrong direction. So let's see what we got. Right, go ahead and through those Gen 6 stacks, or Gen 5 stacks in with no other changes, and look at what we got. Now this is not optimized. I had put the original street map back in and then I go back and optimize later. So basically what we have, we have an almost identical overlay all the way up to the top, but the Gen 5's lost power compared to the printed stacks, especially up top. So in this particular instance, this is a great example. Even though I didn't elect to leave the printed stacks in the bike, if these were my two options, I'm going to go ahead and leave the printed stacks in because I want that extra power up here. I just don't want to lose a bunch down here. Now, let's go apples to apples though. I hadn't optimized the fueling yet for the Gen 5 stacks, so we're going to go ahead and throw that in. Now, come on back here, and you can see, all right, so that's the blue line. I split the difference between the red and the green, but the Gen 5 stacks just couldn't make as much horsepower optimized as the printed. And then if I, it basically, let me, uh, let me pull all this stuff out of here and I'm gonna go with the, uh, so now let's, this is just an overview of what made me keep the Gen 6 stacks in the bike. So after all this testing, if I go in here and I compare the Gen 6 stacks that were optimized to the printed carbon stacks, which were optimized to the Gen 5 stacks, which were optimized. And what do we got? The red line are the Gen 6 OEM stacks through the middle. And you can see even down here, they got a little bit of a gap. Nice little gap here, comparatively. I mean, we're looking at, we're looking at, you know, three, three or four horsepower. And when we go up here up top, what do we got? All right, so the, uh, the printed carbon stacks actually made the most peak power up in here. But once again, I'll go ahead and give up a horsepower or so there because let's think about this. This is all the way at the top end of the RPM range. So if you're land speed racing, all right, I don't want to get off of a story tangent here, but when I ran 200 miles an hour at Maxton on my Hayabusa, my data logger said, and this is a standing start mile, I was in sixth gear at wide open throttle for 10 seconds. Terrifying, I hate land speed. But 10 seconds. So you and I, if you're riding on the street, if you're road racing, basically I don't care if you're doing anything else, you're going to be moving up this curve, and by the time you get to that power gauge, you gotta shift. Where do you shift? You go back on the curve, and you wanna start the next gear with as much power as possible. Now, if you're land speed racing, that's where you really wanna fine tune up in here, because it may take you 10 seconds to go from here to here. And why not have as much peak horsepower available in that area if that's where you're working at that time. So little little lesson. That's why we went back to the Gen 6 stacks. The, the, the engineers 
know what's going on. They know what we're going to do. And that's why they picked them. And that's why I picked them. Am I saying you can't do better than this? No. But for this particular comparison, it's, it was a Jensen six stacks all the way. Now, let's get into some bigger horsepower. Even bigger? They just made 206 horsepower. Bigger horsepower? Ha! Watch this. Okay, guys, before we get into that extra power, there's one other thing I wanted to point out. Now, I like talking about horsepower, mid-range, peak, acceleration, but what does acceleration actually mean? And this is a great example. I'm gonna go ahead and leave this up. I'm gonna leave up uh, our Gen 6 map, or our Gen 6 combination, and then I'm gonna pull back in, just taking off pulling out the velocity stacks with, with no other changes. Now we already talked about the power that was lost by going with those all short stacks. And I talked about you, you don't want to lose that kind of acceleration up the curve. Well, one good way, and DinoJet used to have a beautiful way to do it, but nothing changed on this bike. All of this stuff was done within a matter of hours. So let me go over here and change the scale from RPM to time. So with no other changes, the Gen 6 combination, which is this, look how much by the time to hit the red line, that took 8.06 seconds. When we pulled the stacks out, it took all the way to 8.6 seconds. So that just gives you an example of how much quicker the Gen 6 optimized uh, configuration moved through the RPM range than pulling the stacks out for a combination that really isn't suggested. Now, let's go to big power. All right, big power. What's that mean? We throwing on a turbo? No. Nitrous? No. Those are big power. But what we're talking about here is just exactly how much power can we make out of this 2021 ZX-10 optimizing everything. So the next logical progression to what we're doing is let's put in some good gas. Now, if you're a fan of the channel and you understand what we do around here, the number one horsepower gaining fuel for normally aspirated motorcycles that don't have a ton of compression is VP's MR12. The stuff's amazing. Um, and this particular application though, it was, I love my notes, one month later. <laughs> So unfortunately, that month happened to end up being in a warmer, more humid part of the year. So basically, you sort of have to take out the old numbers and throw them away and start again. So we put, we got the Gen 6 stacks, we put everything back, 89, we got 89 pump gas, we've got our, our standard uh, street map in there, basically the same configuration um, that we had previously except now we're doing it in different weather conditions. And we, you know, we just have to get a little, we have to get a little baseline around here. All right, all things being equal, absolutely nothing else has changed. You can see we are now the blue line and we are the happy recipients of less horsepower everywhere. Thanks to mother nature. Be a bit sometimes. Anyway, so what do, what do we do with that? It doesn't matter. Horsepower gains are relative to the day that you're making them. So if we can pick up horsepower on this day, another day, we would have picked up the same amount for higher peak numbers. These numbers are lower, just doesn't make any difference. So first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna go in here, uh, optimize everything for the conditions still with the pump gas, I don't even need you to zoom up on this. It didn't really do anything. We picked it up a little bit. Uh, we ended up leaning it down because we had uh, the, uh, the dyno was crazy. 90, almost 91 degrees in the dyno. The absolute pressure was down. The humidity was up. The correction factor was up. Everything about this time to test these parts sucked, but we're doing the best we can. So let's start off with optimized. And now let's go ahead all right, guys, we dumped in the MR12, <laughs> but it was really obvious right off the bat that it needed to be fully mapped. Our air-fuel ratio went crazy. I don't want to hurt Mike's bike, so we went ahead, did a full tune on it uh, with, the v with the MR12, and this is what we got. 
Look at that, look at the gap here. That stuff is just amazing. It is literally pour in horsepower. Just pour it in and make, and make more power. You can run it without the additional mapping, but yeah, you really, especially if you do a lot of high speed stuff, you can hurt things. So from there, what, what even is there left to do? We got a pit of carbon, we got a sprint filter, we got an ECU flash, we got a power commander, we got a map. What's left? Well, the last little thing, if you know our combination, and listen guys, I can't even emphasize enough, go to our Jigsilla series. It explains every bit of this that happened in full detail. The fact that the bike has a different name on the gas tank and a different color makes no difference. The same procedures were used. I'm just showing you the end result. So what's left? Well, we mentioned previously that the bike had 10W40 Kawasaki full synthetic oil in there. Well, our cocktail is Allison less than zero weight oil with our Petron additive. So we drained it out. Let me go ahead and get rid of this previous one. And we put in the Allison and I went and I went for a drive. Now here's an oil change. All right. Look at there, we got a gap everywhere. I get a whole lot, of, well, there's, there's three horsepower, that's nice. Well, I get this all the time. Man, Brock, Allison and Petron, do I really gotta put the Petron in? Do I really gotta run the less than zero? Don't run less than zero if you live on the surface of the sun, run the, run the uh, zero 020. But yes, we use the Allison, we're in normal, normal conditions. Now, is that worth that gain worth the price that you have to pay. Like I mentioned before, that, that 1040 synthetic, that is badass stuff. And it is rated for the H2, the supercharged bike. So that means the supercharger won't, it won't aerate the oil and you won't have problems with, at 130,000 RPM. That shit's the bomb, great stuff. Remember acceleration up the curve, you don't see that. Everybody talks about the dyno numbers. Well, let's go and look now. No other changes. What happened to the acceleration? Go back here to time. Now, now think about why would it accelerate? We're going from a 10W40, which is basically syrup in the bathtub, to Allison less than zero weight oil, which means <laughs> that means that at temperature, this stuff is like water, literally. And then we put the Petron additive in there just to, um, it's got some solids in there that goes and coats the parts. Yet again, I could do videos on all of this stuff, but why? Now we've got syrup in our bathtub uh, that our crankshaft and everything's trying to spin through. Now we'll change that into water in the bathtub. Hey, this is a lot easier. How much easier? Look at that. There we are again. There's the blue one. There's how long it took to get to the rev limiter with the Allison. What are we looking at? Uh, 7.6 seconds. How long did it take with the Kawasaki? 8.16. That is a full second quicker up the curve, and this is only in one gear. Yes, it's expensive, but damn it, we wouldn't sell it if it didn't make results like this. All right, we are getting close to the end. And when I say the end, all right, so basically what I did, the owner, the other Mike, was coming into town to pick up the motorcycle. So I just went and put it back to our best combination on pump gas. And then I worked with Brendan at BT Motor on their stage two flash, which did a couple different things. It smoothed out the throttle even more, but it also optimized the kill times. The ZX-10s have really long OEM kill times when you're using the shifter. Uh, and we did a little bit of, of change the timing around a little bit and just, just little silly stuff. So let me show you what, how I had the bike right before Mike showed up. Let me go ahead and put this back. All right. So back to our optimized setup now, yet again, <laughs> this was a, this was later weeks later. So the weather was better. So the stuff that was making 206 before. All of a sudden, 
the last three dyno pulls on this bike. Come on up. I'll, I'll just go ahead and show you. That one, that one, and that one. The last three pulls in a row, 207 horsepower. The very last pull that the bike saw on this dyno was 207.5A. All right, that's as good as I know how to make this thing. But I think what I'm gonna do, um, I'm gonna go ahead and take it for a ride to make sure everything's working properly. And maybe I'll see if I can go pick on that uh, long-term project bike here when I go on my ride. I'll see you in a minute. Hey guys, like I mentioned previously, all bikes feel fast when you're all by yourself. But the question is, <laughs> when you go riding with a friend who you know has a fast bike, then how fast are you? We've got Mike Jeffrey back, Mike J. Um, not to be confused with Mike G. We both have lots of ZX10s. It's my number. But anyway, we're just gonna go. We're gonna uh, we're gonna go hit Mexico here real quick and just sort of see how this bike does, and then. I would like to put Mike on this bike to get his comparison between his uh, 2016 and the 2021 here. So we will uh, get suited up, get the GoPro fired up, and let you know what happens. <laughs> Tell you what, your bike is no joke in the first couple of years. I, I gotta tell you, I, I think a lot of it's the wheels, and then also the bit you're uh, aerodynamically, you're just a bigger dude, which is helping me catch up top. Yeah, but for being uh, a 2016 with 30,000 miles on it, <laughs> wait, hold on, it's the Sprint Filter test bike. It can't, yep. it can't run that good, Mike. There's no uh, way. The, the filter lets all kinds of debris in there and ruins your performance. Yeah, my uh, <laughs> my cylinders and everything, I'm probably going to have to do a valve job on this when we get back. You know what? It, yeah, I was going to say, your your, your valves are, your valves are, your valve lash is probably all squished up for some magical reason that I haven't been able to figure out yet. People are hilarious. <laughs> Hey, do you want to switch bikes here real quick? Yeah, we can do that. Got it? Yep. Really good. 
I mean, it was bad. Uh, let's see. What do you think about it? I, I really like it so far. Yeah, I would gear it just a little differently, but as far as how it handles, power delivery, everything is it's awesome. Sweet. I really like it. Alright, well, let's go ahead and head back then. I'm, I'm sort of enjoying riding yours. <laughs> Even that little transition there on and off the gas. This one feels a little jerky. Yeah, it snaps. Well, that was fun. That was fun. I like work days like this. <laughs> work. That's, that's, it almost seems a crime to call it that, doesn't it? It does. It does. All right, guys. Well, as you can see, we had a hell of a time. That 2021 ZX-10 is the real deal. It's a really, really nice bike, but you saw the comparison with Mike's bike, and we'll get that get to that here in a minute. But how does this bike compare to some of the other really fast bikes out there? So I went ahead and, uh, and pulled up some sheets. Now, <laughs> we sort of glanced over it previously, but with the MR-12 in there, the bike made 214.85 horsepower. Damn, it's a normally aspirated 1000. And that is a new all time Brock's performance record for a stock bike with all bolt on parts that have been optimized. That's a lot of horsepower, but let's compare it to some of the other bikes in the past so that you can have an idea what's going on. Obviously, one of the bikes that we reference all the time is Jixilla. If you haven't seen that series, we start with a bone stock bike and we end up with the bike in super stock, full super stock trim, which is a class in the XDA. You can look that up. But basically, it's for completely stock bikes, lowered, re geared. You can't build the engine, you can't degree the cams. The engine has to be perfectly stocked. And we went out to MIR and Jeremy Teasley, we put him on the bike. Jeremy ran an 886 at 162.8 miles an hour. The blue curve is what Jixilla looked like right before we loaded it in the trailer. And you can see, that's that Jixer, man, it is really strong through the middle, but you come up here up top and it's, it's not even a race. That ZX-10 has so much power. So that's one of the things. And uh, listen guys, this is all land, this is all real world stuff. I'm not saying that a GSXR set up the same isn't fast, top speed wise, but that ZX-10, apples to apples, same rider, same weight, same everything, that ZX-10 is going to really, really, really outrun that GSXR. It's just, it's, it's math, guys. But if you're road racing or riding on the street or doing whatever, that Jigs are super strong in here. They're both good engines. It just depends on what you want to do. So now we have to go back to what was the other really fast bike we did. Well, that's the 2020 BMW S1000RR. And that thing is badass. Our buddy Tonsi loaned us the bike. We developed all the parts. We did exactly the same as we did here. Worked with Bren Tuning. We got a great video on that. Um, I'll pull up the dyno chart of that bike right before we left for another uh, race at uh, Maryland International Raceway. I'll, let's, I'll leave them all three up there, but the green one is the BMW. So if you look here, the BMW revs even higher. Up here at the top, look at this. 210 to 214 peak power. The ZX-10 made more peak power. Now, you come down in the curve here, and the BMW is acting a little bit more like the GSXR. They both have a bit of an advantage up the curve, up in here. Man, that BMW is super, super tough, but the numbers don't lie. We could not get 214 horsepower out of that BMW, no matter how hard we tried. We did out of the ZX-10. So the ZX-10 is officially, the 2021 ZX-10 is officially the most horsepower this dyno has ever seen. I have a normally aspirated bike. It's basically stock trim. So, with all that said, whew, going through a lot of stuff, aren't we? Let me just get rid of everything except for 
the very last pull on the bike before the owner, Mike Gear, arrived was 207.58. Now, <laughs> technical crap. If you watch the video where Mike and I did our little roll on in Mexico, you can tell we sort of had a problem. <laughs> Well, our editing and video genius was busy doing other things, so we tried to stumble through it, and we failed. And I gotta tell you, we've got so much video. Mike rode the, rode the other bike. The owner, Mike Gear, shows up, and Mike rides the bike. He loves it, Gear. He goes out and rides with Mike Jeffrey on the on our uh, Sprint Filter test bike. Man, they're just having a ball, swapping stories, and it is all just junk. I apologize. I can't show it to you. But one thing I would like to do, and Mike uh, Gear, bless his heart, that dude, he sent us a video because he's so impressed with how smooth the bike is. I know we keep harping on that, but man, it is really liquid smooth. He sent us a video that we'll finish up uh, this video with showing just exactly how smooth and controllable the throttle is on that bike. But now, let's go ahead and look at exactly what Mike was running versus what I was running because we went ahead and threw this bike up there. Uh, uh, I'll put the uh, <laughs> I'll put the uh, I'll put the pat put bike's bike up. And this was just at it was a little bit after we uh, we went on our roll on. And if you see in the I'll, I'll tell you what I put in the notes. Uh, it had an additional five pounds of dirt. It's been road hard, put away wet. Um, we threw it up on the dyno, and this is what we got. Horsepower wise, man, that 2021. And it's funny, look at, look at how eerily similar the curves are. You can tell they have the same technology inside the engine, but Mike's ZX-10, it even has the, uh, it has the factory intake cam in there, the, the race cam, and they look almost identical. It's amazing, but that 2021 is just moving. Man, it just, it moves, it moves more air in and more air out, and it makes a lot of power. Well, you could see that by the way I was, I was reeling him in, and I could have kept going, but I like long bikes that are low, not short bikes that are tall, you know, going the speed of sound. So, uh, anyway, how... Could Mike's bike do so well? Well, let's think about this. That five pounds of dirt is layered all over beautiful BST carbon fiber rims. Mike has also, um, he's got carbon fiber body work. Man, he has done a whole lot of stuff. And let's talk about optimization. Mike's a physically larger dude than me. He's not huge or anything. He's a big boy, he's, he's stout. So he optimized his gearing. Let's go back to that whole acceleration thing where how could Mike be so competitive? Well, let's look at it. Now, and this isn't a great comparison, but it gives you an idea. Mike's bike is the blue line. 6.4 seconds to 7.8. He has optimized his acceleration. He's optimized his gearing. This isn't a truly fair comparison. I just want to give you an idea of the improvements that you can make to your own motorcycle. If you don't have the money for the latest, greatest, most crazy horsepower 1000 you can buy, start doing cool stuff like Mike did. His bike's got 31,000 miles on it. He beats the shit out of it and it runs great and it hang it listen put a smaller guy and mike's bike's going to be right next to that 2021 so anyway whew, seven pages of notes months and months of data crammed into one video 
I hope you like it. <laughs> I hope it doesn't see, come off as flaky because we had to do stuff crazy and we had technical problems anyway. Man, we're doing the best we can. We, we've got a great problem here at Brock's Performance. We are growing like mad. If you've ever been here before, you, and if you've been back to my office, it doesn't exist anymore. I don't work in this building. This is, has a dyno and it has a warehouse. I move, I've, I move somewhere else. Brock doesn't work here. People come to visit, they're like, he doesn't work here anymore. How could Brock not work here? Okay, it's all craziness. But anyway, just want to give you an idea of some of the stuff that we're doing. And you know what? That's a pretty good segue into some of the things that we're going to be bringing you. You know, our industry is pre has pretty much always been the same for years, but there are some changes on the horizon. Some people like them, some people don't. I honestly, I'm always interested in learning new things. So a friend of mine sent me something that I think you might like. Let me show it to you real quick. When I say we've got some unique projects coming up for 2023, I think you'll agree with me. Safety first. 